Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess, Chess Books Recaptured. For those who have not heard these before, this is a, in theory, monthly book recap pod. We're running a little late. Sorry for the d- the delay. We've actually been ready to do this for weeks, but my poor guest co-host, who I will bring in in a minute, has been battling a vicious version of the flu, but he's finally sounding good, and he's been ready from day one. As I mentioned in last month, he sent me an outline like, right from the beginning. And what we're going to talk about this month is First Book of Morphe by Frisco Del Rosario. This book, of course, has the coveted Neil Bruce stamp of approval. Uh, For those of you who've heard Neil on the podcast, he always has his finger on the pulse of good books for uh, adult, newer chess players, as Neil was one himself. This book, I think, is greatly suited to, uh, I would say, under 15, under 1400 online. And of course, because you're you're learning from Paul Morphy, you can learn at a higher level than that too. But I think that's really the sweet spot. And there's pros and cons about this book that we will be uh, getting into in, in due time. But first, let's introduce our co-host. He is a busy Danish dad, an on-again, off-again adult improver, and a linguist by day. And we are uh, very grateful that he is taking the time from his hectic life uh, to join us. So Mas Jonsson, Mas, thanks for helping out this month. Thanks for having me, Ben. And Mas, this book, of course, Neil Bruce has, as I mentioned, he's um, recommended it a few times to the point where I finally got it just so I could, I since I'm not as well versed in the, the newer club player books as Neil, I got it just so I could check it out. So I'd taken a cursory look at it in the past and I liked the expository style of the book. And obviously I liked the subject of Morphe, but I hadn't read it completely until our interview. So I'm going to reveal my opinion um, <laughs> in it about it in due time. But first, yeah. could you Moss, say a bit about your experience with first book of Morphe? Yeah, definitely. Because my experience with this book goes actually back to when I started playing chess as at a, a series of level as as I can, I guess. When I was in my early 30s, I didn't have any kids back then, so I had a little bit more study time on my hands. Um, I came across this book, and I thought it was a really good. Uh, it, it it would be a really good illustration of a. a a series of fundamental principles on how to play chess, uh, quote unquote, correctly, or how to acquire some fundamental chess skills while studying the games of one of the most legendary masters of chess. Uh, So I've actually had this book for uh, just about a decade now, and I keep coming back to it from time to time. If I lose a game because the opponent got a rook on the seventh rank or something like that. I might go back and study the chapter in the end game section of this book um, to see, okay, so what mechanisms were uh, in play here? And could I have learned something from taking a look at these games from the book? Uh, so it's actually a book that I have, uh, that I have used a lot um, uh, trying to pick up some practical chess uh, pieces of chess advice. Yeah, and I know, Moss, that you're very well read when it comes to uh, chess books for players around your level. Um, you, you've mentioned several other books, um, and we'll we'll compare and contrast as we go yeah. on. But so, it, to your mind, what set this apart from other books? Um, first of all, the fact that it's a monography that that's uh, uh, that's um, that's a relatively rare thing, at least around my level, to have a book full of games by just one player. Um, you can buy a ton of game collections uh, by by one player, for instance. I mean, we all know Bobby Fischer's game book, uh, My 60 Memorable Games and stuff like that. But usually they will be at a level a little bit too high for where I'm currently at and will probably, let's face it, remain for a very long time. So, so that set this book apart that all these principles, all these rules of how to how to learn fundamental chess skills were all by one player. 
And that one player then, as you find out, not through this book, but through, I don't know, you can Wikipedia him or find some videos about his games. Uh, you find out that he is actually also a really legendary figure that has uh, quite a few stories linked to his name. So yeah. so it's it's actually the fact that you get to study chess games from the uh from the pioneer age of modern chess um so to speak um combined with the fact that it is supposed to be a lot clearer to follow than games by modern masters uh that makes it a, a very appealing book to me Yeah, and we should say for context, you rated about uh, 1,400 Blitz on Lee Chess. Um, Just something and, like that, yeah. And yeah, as a linguist, I'm impressed with your use of the word uh, monography, amazing command of, of English. Uh, Thank Mas. you. Thank you, um, man. So, so to discuss a little bit more information about the book, because unlike a lot of the books we've discussed, uh, this one, again, despite the aforementioned Neil Bruce seal of approval, beyond that, I don't feel like it has as big a reputation, of course, as a book like My System or Zurich 1953. Um, so to give a few more details, this book was uh, self-published in 2006. Uh, there's yeah. no ebook, as far as I can tell. But important caveat, there are Lee Chess studies. There's two different Lee Chess studies with all the games linked to them. So again, that's sort of a way to do like a DIY uh, ebook. If you sit there with a book and you have the Lee Chess study open, whether on a tablet or a computer, you can play through the moves electronically yeah. if that's your inclination. Uh, the author um, is a chess teacher who lives in California. He edited the California Chess Journal. At his peak, he was about 2100 USCF. Uh, he won the National Chess Journalist of the Year in 2005. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a pretty well well written book. Um, and I know you've done some digging as well into um, Del Rosario's background. What did you discover, Mas? Well, basically that. And then he uh, he maintains a Twitter account where he tweets a lot about basketball. <laughs> uh, that that's pretty much what I know about him. Uh, then he's written another book that that has kind of an educational purpose as well. Um, about uh, different checkmating patterns uh, illustrated uh, with uh, games by Capablanca. Uh, so, so that's actually, well, I, I guess that's another monography, right? But, but it's a little bit more uh, specific in that it, it studies the, the various well-known checkmating patterns. It's actually, that's based on a book by a couple of French guys, um, Uh, Khan and Renault, if I'm not oh, mistaken. Oh, yeah, The Art of Checkmate. Yeah. The Art of Checkmate, yeah. Uh, so so it kind of follows that pattern. But but this, the first book of Morphe, is uh, is, is more generic in its nature. I mean, it, it has 10 principles of good opening play, 10 principles of good middle game play, and 10 principles of good end game play, all structured in, in, in one chapter each. Yeah, um, and I think those principles are are highly valuable. I think definitely, the, yeah. The, it's stuff like that, like the little listicles and stuff like that, where he really shines. And to the extent there are weaknesses in the book, it's the lack of like a game summary, um, yeah, and some other sort of stylistic choices that that we will subsequent subsequently get into. Um, Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is, of course, part of the reason I, that we find this book so valuable to study is just Morphe's games. I mean, as yeah, you said, definitely, Mas, total legend. Um, and uh, as has come up repeatedly on this podcast, uh, it's it's generally a good way to learn chess. Is to if you go back farther in time, people are are playing worse, and that makes it uh, often easier to to learn from from what we see. I mean, as we record this, Mas, the World Championship is suddenly uh, careening towards a rapid conclusion. Yeah, but, yeah. But even what passes for a blunder is there's always multiple moves involved and it's not, uh, you know, even these air quotes shocking blunders by Napomniachi that we've seen in recent days. It's still a few moves and it doesn't culminate in this like fiery checkmate the way that Morphe's games Too. No, no, it doesn't. And when you when you look at chess games, when you're at around my level, right? You look at chess games um, at the level of the current championship match. Okay, uh, you could see uh, the other day that that uh, Nepomniachtchi blundered a pawn, and and what in football you'd label it field position a little bit, right? Um, but but that's hardly a decisive blunder at my level. But but you can see like before I before I read this book for the first time, I didn't know why it was necessarily a good thing to open with a center pawn. 
then you look at a guy called Carr, Jabez Carr, I think, uh, open with three consecutive flank pawn moves against Morphe and get completely crushed in like 15 moves. So you can you can observe that game and you can see, all right, maybe it's a good idea to open with the center pawn. Maybe it's at least a good idea to open focusing on the center. Yeah, and again, I mean, Morphe's games are just so instructive. He's so ruthlessly punished the, the players he's playing that whether or not yeah. uh, someone um, your level or newer to chess is whether or not they decide to study this book in particular, uh, studying the games of Morphe is definitely a fantastic idea. I mean, Absolutely. And you still see it when you look at like modern club players games, you still see one player might uh, neglect opening principles. Um, and a lot of it yeah. is opening principles. I know that he breaks it into three categories and there are some end games, but I mean, Morphe's real strength was having superior understanding to his opponents of sort of uh, development and initiative. Um, yeah. Definitely, which makes for fun viewing. And of course, there's fun openings throughout. I mean, this was the romantic era of chess. So we got the King's Gambits and the Evans Gambits and all that stuff. And we've got our first, I think, actually only Patreon mailbag question from Alex Friedman, who says there's some controversy online about whether Morphe's playing strength was weaker than an IM today. What do you think? Um, and Alex, um, you th I think he's referring to, there's been discussion in online forums. Um, again, yeah. we're, we're both fans of Ben Feingold's video and one that I think we both saw. He's kind of uh, count, He's kind of responding to a video that Josh Friedel had done, sort of criticized, yeah. Grandmaster Josh Friedel had done criticizing Morphe's level of play. So um, the first thing I want to say in response to Alex's question is as, as like a lowly 21, 20, formerly 2200 player, I didn't feel super qualified to judge this on my own. I'm certainly aware of the debates. But the first thing that has to be said is Morphe was full stop the best player in the world at his peak. And how he compares objectively to players of this era, I think is not as important. I mean, they were figuring stuff out on their own. And, uh, you know, at his peak, the tactics that he plays are clearly I am strength. I mean, they're just dazzling tactical displays, as Moss mentioned in, in some of the combinations that he uncorks. Um, yeah. He, he might have some weaknesses in other phases of the game. And I did want to try to put some data to this rather than just sort of pontificate. So I went back right. to uh, Professor Ken Regan, who uh, wrote this famous paper in 2012 on the idea of intrinsic performance rating that I think came up briefly in my interview with Dr. Mark Glickman, uh, rating expert in his own right. And of course, there's sites like chessmetrics.com that go back and look at different players and try to apply a strength uh, by comparing their moves to engine moves. And so Ken did quantify Morphe's strength. And he he looked at, and this is using 2012 engines, so it's not going to be like 100% accurate by today's standards. Engines are like 500 points stronger now somehow. Yeah. Um, but he gave uh, Morphe in what he considered 59 of his most important games, uh, an intrinsic performance rating of 2344. Um so that's like right on the border of IM strength. Um, and again, when you play through the games, they're very uneven. So again, he might have grandmaster level tactics, but like, you know, 1900 level position, positional understanding or something like that. So yeah. that does give you context. But the differences in the games, again, for, for players newer to chess, the way that Morphe is able to punish mistakes is something that is unlike clearly very instructive. So to me, it's kind of an academic debate, and I'm not generally a big fan of uh, comparing players across eras. It's very difficult because a lot of these games, a lot of the games that are in this book are from 1857 or 1858, which was uh, kind of the the, uh, the peak of Morphe's powers, right? And he was so much ahead of the other players of his time that uh, there's a game, I think it's in this book, where uh, he plays a simultaneous um, exhibition. And, and one of the opponents is Henry Bird, who is another elite player of the era. And he beats him fairly quickly. Uh, so, so he's up against some of the other elite players in simultaneous events. Uh, and some of them even blindfold simultaneous events and still beats them. So, so, I mean, there, there's no doubt that compared to his competition, Morphe is so much stronger that you've probably never seen anything like it in any other sport or any other game ever. Uh, I, I think I compared it to, it, it would be like being the Babe Ruth in baseball if, if the Babe was the first one to 
uh, discover pool hitting or something like that. Like he was miles ahead of the competition here. Yeah, Fisher might be the closest analog. Fisher, of course, had the short reign of dominance, yeah. and and Morphy's reign also was was relatively short. But yeah, I mean, in terms of just watching someone just thrash weaker players, uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot to be to be learned um, from studying him. Um, so, what can we say about how the book is structured, Mass? I mean, as you mentioned, there's 30 chapters, so we're not going to yeah. read read all the chapters. Was there were there any that like particularly struck you? Yes, a chapter that I've learned a lot from is one of the opening chapters um, that is titled "Always Develop with Threats." So every time you activate a piece, it should do something. That that is essentially what I got out of that chapter. And there's an excellent Morphe game there against uh, Liechtenstein, a, a King's Gambit game from uh, from 1849. So when Morphe was 11 or 12 years old where every time he moves something in the first 10 or 15 moves of the game, it activates a piece or a pawn with some kind of threat. So, so that principle and that chapter was, was just excellent to pick up some knowledge about purpose in, in, in the opening and in the structuring of your position at chess. Yeah, and uh, Del Rosario does a good job of sort of using a sort of space repetition or certain sort of catchphrases in the book and yeah. developing with threats is one of them that, that I think could be quite helpful, you know, to just sort of um, really ring home uh, the various lessons that he's trying to impart. Now, unfortunately, so I really like the like developing with a threat, developing with a threat, and it is reminiscent somewhat of uh, Irving Chernev's um, writing style. And of yeah. course, I, we already did a podcast on logical chess move by move, which is one of the many books I'll be comparing this to at the end. But then he has some other sort of stock phrases that uh, that I didn't land as much with me personally, at least. He really loves this guy, Cecil Purdy. Who yeah, that's true. Legendary correspondence player and author. I have to confess, I haven't read any of Cecil Purdy's book, but books, but he is kind of, I mean, the guy is like a legendary writer from earlier times but he's just like quoting him like scripture throughout the book and one of the quotes is uh use use an active force examine moves that smite um and since no one really talks that way i just find like you know developing with a threat like that resonates because people yeah. talk and think that way but when you say examine moves that smite it's kind of like a record scratch to me because i'm like all right well you know i had to look up smite like you know <laughs> what, what exactly are you trying yeah. to impart here um, and there's a lot of mentions of Purdy throughout the book, which I, I uh, nothing against Purdy again, but I could have done with a few, a few less. That that's true, and and you're right with that kind of vocabulary. It seems kind of dated, especially since there's another chapter, another excellent chapter in the book um, called uh, "Have All Your Moves Fit Into a Specific Plan." Um, so basically, those two uh, set phrases that you mentioned there. Could be contained and developed with a threat, and have all your move have all your moves fit into a specific plan, so that every time you activate a piece, you know what it's doing, and you kind of have a um, plan across your moves uh, as long as it's possible in a game. It's it's obvious that if you're a grandmaster, you you can you can change your plans more often. You can be more dynamic, and you can also know more about what you're doing than if you play at my level, for instance. But it's a good idea to 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 choose an opening and know what that opening does right off the bat, and and I think chapters like these certainly will help you if you're around my level or uh, from, shall we say, eleven twelve hundred and and uh, and a few hundred points up. Yeah, and again, the games themselves. I mean, they they practically speak for themselves in yeah. a way that that's unique uh, in terms of, especially compared to modern games. And for the record, smite means strike with a firm blow. If there's anyone else listening who's uh, as as ignorant as me, um, so there. And then there's other little stylistic things. Now, I I understand, Moss, that you came across an interview where uh, Del Rosario said something along the lines of he wrote the best book he could at the time. That That's thing? actually from the foreword for his his next book, uh, the Capablanca book, where he goes over a few recommendations of other books that you can read to kind of support that um, that collection of checkmating patterns and and what that book is supposed to do. 
uh, and he mentions the first book of Morphe, and he uh, he actually says that it, it didn't become the success I was hoping for, but it was the best book I could write at the time. He doesn't go into any further detail, but he does insinuate that that maybe there were some things that he would have done differently if he were to write it today. Yeah, and and I want to be clear that there are things again. There are things that are great about it. He has he has some nice little wisdom okay. in in the lists. I guess I'll read just one of the lists just to sort of give context and give actual chess improvement tips. So here are the ten middle game rules that uh, that he shared. Um, have all your moves fit into a definite plan. When your material head exchanges many pieces as possible, especially queens. Avoid doubled, isolated, and backward pawns. And cramp positions. Free yourself by exchanging. Don't expose your king while the enemy queen is still on the board. Um, all combinations are based on a double attack. When your opponent has one or more pieces exposed, um, look for a combination. To, to attack the king, you must first open a file to gain access for your heavy pieces. Centralize the action of your pieces, and the best defense is a counterattack. So, I mean, those are super helpful, although similar yeah. to um, my mild critique of... Um, Jeremy Silliman's How to Reassess Your Chess, sometimes like there could be too much information. Like it could be distilled to fewer tips and then yeah. it might be uh, actually more resonant with the readers. And that's one thing, again, that the with the, the mantras such as developing with initiative and examining moves that's might, um, whether you like the mantras or not, uh, they, they, you, you will remember them. Um, but overall, I mean, there, there's a lot of good advice packed in, in those lists. Um, one other critique I had of the book, um, I don't know if you shared this, Moss. I'm certainly was, uh, in the outline that we've shared, I made no secret of it, but, um, he mentions in the prologue, a sort of, uh, disdain for exclamation points and, yeah. and question marks. Um, so before I launched into my spiel, did you, how, how much did you note that when you, when you read it, uh, on your own? A lot, uh, really a lot, because the, the notation style in this book is what we can call a super minimal uh, algebraic notation. So NF6 can mean both knight takes F6, knight takes F6 check, knight takes F6, F6 checkmate. Uh, so so the, there's, there's a lot of notation missing there, especially if you are um, a relative beginner. It would be nice to have that symbol for a knight takes something, for instance. It makes it easier to look at. And certainly when you're a beginner, it's also a good idea to have the exclamation points and the question marks to see, okay, we, we have a mistake here. Yeah. This is the move where the opponent makes a mistake. Exactly. Yeah. And that was kind of my my biggest critique is that often if you play through the game and you might have to play through it several times to figure yeah. out what decided the game, because for one thing, stylistically, without the exclamation points and question marks, it's harder to identify. And I felt like on top of that, he didn't go out of his way. Like if if you're going to roll with that style, you've got to really say, OK, this is what he did wrong and yeah. be very specific about it. And just for, for the record, um, he quoted Petro the reason he came to this stylistic choice. He quotes uh, Tigran Petrosian, former world champion in the introduction and says, and this is Tigran who wrote, oh, those exclamation and question marks, how they erode the soul of the amateur, making it impossible for him to critically evaluate the idea of another. So it was based on that quote that he came to that decision. But I mean, to me, as you were saying, Moss, I mean, chess is just so hard. There's so much to disentangle that uh, part of the reason that people are interested in move by move books is because it, it elucidates as much as yeah. possible. So why not use like every tool available? Um, so it really, it almost, to, to me in my um evaluation of the book, it really played an outsized role because the more I read, the more it bothered me. You know, I just it's, went further and further into the book. And, you know, it's definitely. like the opera game, the most famous chess game of all time. Yeah. Like, how do you have the opera game and have no exclamation points in there, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Queen B3, a move that we I've, I've, I've used so many times in club games and stuff like that, inspired by that game. It must be a good move, right? And, and, uh, yeah, in my in my opinion, unfortunately, it significantly reduces the quality of the book because the notation becomes difficult to look at. And you, it's true you can have a lead chess study uh, on the side open while you have the book, but then it, it, it becomes kind of weird to 
one moment you're looking at the screen, one moment you're looking at the book, and the book is kind of hard to look at. Plus, back when I got this book, there was no lead chest study. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a big disadvantage that uh, he, that Del Rosario has made this uh, decision concerning the, the notation. It's a yeah. real shame. Yeah, it is a shame. And as we said, this book was published, uh, you know, um, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, so... I'm sure he might do it differently and maybe there would be another version. I mean, I don't, you know, he may have written at one point that it wasn't selling that well, but I feel yeah. like, I feel like anecdotally it might be doing better thanks in part to, to, uh, to Neil Bruce. So maybe, maybe another version yeah. is possible at some point. That so, would be very welcome. Yeah. Yeah, it would. And I, I love, you know, and as you said, I also love the idea of the monography and I love the, uh, the idea of explaining as many moves as possible. Yeah. Um, when it comes to discussing the favorite games, I mean, that's obviously a place, uh, where, you know, we could go on forever and this is audio only. So we've got to be careful about sort of uh, waxing rhapsodic about various combinations. But um, but I certainly, in addition to the opera games, uh, there's a game, Scholten, um, where he sacks for a violent attack and ends with a beautiful checkmating combination. Yeah. Um, a couple games against Paulson that, that I enjoyed. What about you, Amas? Uh, I, I actually have kind of a particular game that I've learned a lot from in this book and that I keep coming back to uh, because Morphy doesn't win and his opponent is... Uh, is, is unknown. He's a guy called Guy Bear in a simultaneous exhibition in Paris in 1858. And the reason why I've used it a lot is that Guy Bear plays the Scandinavian defense against Morphy and holds a draw, okay, because Morphy misses a few winning combinations and okay, because it was on travel day and it was 1858 and he was <laughs> tired and possibly sick. Um, and, and Del Rosario has a few, uh, you know, uh, rough words directed at Guibert's playing style uh, underway and, and calls him a dour defender and, and all kinds of other things. But he holds a draw against Paul Morphy in 1858. So the guy must be doing something right. Uh, and he was probably a Parisian amateur. And, and um, the fact that that game starts like that made me start using the Scandinavian as a weapon in, in uh, my club games, actually. And I started holding draws against much, much stronger players. Uh, so, so yeah, I actually picked up a lot from that particular game, even though it's one of the few games in this book that doesn't have a sparkling finish and doesn't even have any sparkling combinations underway. Yeah, and he actually had. There were some moments where he could have won that game, which would Definitely, have been, yeah. which would have been even even more amazing. And yeah, the Scandi. I think I've mentioned this before, but uh, Peter Svidler, in one of the uh, lectures he did for U.S. Chess School, he was asked to to give to name an underrated opening. Yeah, and he and he said he wasn't just doing it for the LOLs when he named this Scandi, which of course has its rabid online followers and detractors. And I tend to agree. Um, you know, you can end up with a slightly cramped position fairly often, but it's pretty easy to stay out of trouble in the opening playing the Scandi. And the game you mentioned, they play the Queen D8 line, where yeah. again, you're conceding some development, but it's hard to get thrashed based on that alone if you're playing um, at the club club level. So it can it can be a good choice. Um, and if and he, I were to play against Morphe today, I certainly would play the Scandinavian <laughs> yeah, you definitely don't want to play double king pawn. My goodness. I mean, he no, was just no, no, no. destroying people in, in all of the double king pawn lines. Um, so, yeah, and Purdy did have, I mean, uh, sorry, Del, Del Rosario has some memorable instructive lines throughout the book when he's talking about uh, pawn chains and attacking a pawn chain at the base. Yeah. He says it's easier to knock down a structure by wiping out a foundation than by chiseling at the top. Um, he's got lots of little sort of... Uh, useful lessons sprinkled throughout. Um, now, another thing we can compare it to, as we mentioned in the past, uh, Moss, is, uh, you know, Ben Feingold, known as the biggest Morphe fan. Of course, I've yeah. been lucky to have him on the podcast a few times. He's uh, always defending Morphe and has some amazing series online. So, Moss, how, how do you compare Ben's uh, YouTube videos with, with this book? I'm a huge fan of Ben Feingold's videos online. And, and I think, actually... He has a series of videos that he produced about some lesser known Morphe games. Uh, one of my favorite games from this book, he actually did a segment on against Napoleon Mirage, where he uh, 
he finishes the game with a really dazzling combination with two knights and what looks like a queen sacrifice, but it really isn't because if Mirage takes the queen, it's a it's an instant checkmate with with the knights. Um, and and Feingold is really really good at illustrating why Morphy won his games. And of course, he explains it in a very, very entertaining way. So I can only recommend just go to YouTube and search for Fine Gold Morphe, and and you'll you'll certainly you you'll get a lot out of it. Yeah, you'll find many videos, and uh, yeah, I always Ben always makes me laugh as well. I he I know he has a few a few detractors, but uh, he's popular for a reason. And uh, when when you watch him talk about Morphe, that's really like when Ben's. Uh, doing his best work so yeah. shout out to shout out to ben if you uh certainly catch, if you catch wind of this um and please write a book about paul morphy's games yeah next time i talk to ben i've got to ask him because he said in one of our interviews that he was not a big book reader yeah. but then when, when you watch him go on chess history he's he's amazing he knows like every detail so I, yeah. i've got to square the circle of how, how that uh how that came to be yeah also, Ben Feingold was the one who who memorably uh, has a theory that Paul Morphy was a strong um, chess master in his own era, uh, the mid oos or whatever, and then he was sent back in a time machine to the 1850s <laughs> to teach everybody back then how to play chess. And if you go through this book, the first book of Morphy, with that theory in mind, you can kind of see where Feingold gets it from because he he does play next level chess compared to most of his opponents in this book, right? Yeah, he really does. Um, so I made a list of pros and cons for this book that, yeah. I'd, that I'd like to share because I do feel like it's a mixed bag. But the one thing I want to say unequivocally about anyone considering buying it is if you're in the rating range we described, if you're below 1500 online, and if you're wondering if the book will help your chess, then unequivocally the answer is yes to me. Yeah. Um, but between, between there's plenty of explanations. They're not perfect, but they're pretty good. Um, and and Morphe's play just sparkles. So um, the pros that I came up with were amazing games, lots of annotations. Morphe's a beast. Fun yeah. openings. In addition to the Evans and Kings Gambit, there's stuff like the Scotch Gambit, the Two Knights. Um, there's lots of games and the language, despite my my uh, nitpicking about examining moves that smite the the language overall is more modern than Irving Chernev's logical chess move by move um, naturally. So <laughs> it was yeah. written many decades later. Um, now, as for the cons, the big one to me, as we mentioned, is no question marks and exclam exclaims. And right next to it is that it, it's, he doesn't do a good job noting turning points, um, some wrong annotations, of course, uh, no game sort of wrap ups, um, a lot about Cecil Purdy more than more than some uh, might might want. And then one other one is just, um, you know, having recently reread Logical Chess move by move. One thing that really struck me about Chernev is he's just uh it's very, he's just sort of oozing enthusiasm for chess, yeah. Chernev is. And uh, Del Rosario, he's not, not totally lacking, but it's not as much enthusiasm, especially again, without the question marks and exclams, it can be harder to, to ascertain the tone. Um, and again, I dug into a bunch of move by move books that I'd like to talk about, but Mas, uh, anything that I left out or that you disagree on? No, I definitely agree. I mean, it, it's difficult possibly to to purvey as much enthusiasm for chess as Irving Chernev does. Uh, and, and Irving Chernev with, with some of the games in logical chess uh, might go uh, go the other way. He, he uh, at least on one occasion, he puts an exclam at 1e4 because it's yeah. the best move on the board. So, so I mean... But but that's good too. I mean, uh, logical chess move by move is an all time classic in this genre, uh, and and I think one of the good things you can pick up from this book is the opening repertoire because when you're a, a relatively low level chess player, uh, Morphe's openings are good to play, like in uh, Chess Online or Lee Chess or something, Chess dot com. Um, you will get some good games. You will get some fun games if you. Try to play some King's Gambits and and some uh, Evan Gambits, and Evans Gambits, and what uh, uh, whatever, um, and and you can kind of see in the few games in this book uh, that that are not that kind of openings or that are not double king pawn openings, 
uh, if Morphe plays with the black pieces and his opponent plays 1d4, you can kind of hear his groan like, all right, okay, yeah. so let's go into a long one here. And then Morphe plays a Dutch defense, right? And and the end game chapter of uh, the the end game chapters rather of of the first book of Morphe, it the games are not as good because by by nature games that make it to an end game are a little murkier than games that are decided in seventeen moves checkmate with a bunch of material sacrifice. Uh, so certainly the first two thirds of this book uh, are the strongest parts in terms of uh, of learning something as a relatively new chess player. Yeah, that's a good point. And yeah, you don't come to Paul Morphy for the end game lessons, you know. That's Not just really, the, no, no. Yeah. You'd go to Smyslov or Capablanca. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Chernov, in fact, has the, as I often mentioned, the the book of Capablanca's endings. Yes, which um, is excellent. I, yeah. And Chernov, of course, for those who've already done logical chess and looking for more, I'm also a big fan of the most instructive games of all time, which is similar, uh, very expository format. Um, with both of those, obviously, you're going to get ancient games, which is m mostly good, uh, but there are other options. Um, I checked out this book by uh, Alper F. A. Ataman, who is, I believe, a Turkish IM who wrote a book called Instructive Chess Miniatures. Um, and that has newer games. Uh, and I, I, for each of the books I'm going to discuss, I went through a few of the games just to go to get a sense. So, as ha you know, with First Book of Morphe, my impression changed when I read the whole book. Although, again, I still give it a B. I still give it a recommendation. It's just not as full throated as I might have expected. So. Yeah. So caveat that I haven't read these whole books, but Instructive Chess Miniatures looks really good. Uh, Dan Heisman, Friends of the Pod, World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book is really good. Um, and, you know, that's got the unique style in that it's amateur per, amateur players' games. But I was interested that even in an amateur player's games, it's I would say it's more advanced than the other three books we've mentioned, uh, The Most Instructive Games of All Time, The Morphe Book, and Instructive Chess Miniatures. Uh, Dan goes into more variations than others. There's, there's also on uh, Neil McDonald's Chess, The Art of Logical Thinking yeah. from the first move to the last. That one is clearly styled after Chernev. And of course, Neil McDonald being a modern author, again, the language is more modern. And he does, again, look at modern games, which I get the reason for that. You want to show different games. Um, but on the other hand, what we've been saying about Morphe, there's a reason those games are, are so instructive. And whenever you have two super GMs from the past 30, 40 years playing each other, no matter how many annotations you put in, it's going to be hard to describe what really happened because what they're doing is calculating six moves down the line. And yeah. it's hard it's hard to put that into words. And on a similar note, John Nunn's understanding chess move by move, I would describe as the most advanced of, of the lot. Um, and it also, you know, legendary author and player, um, John Nunn, it, it also kind of runs into the same problem in that he does the best he can, but there's going to be 10 move variations somewhere if he's, yeah. if he's going to explain why a game happened. But John Nunn does have the post-game bullet points and stuff like that. So there's, there's lots of options if people are considering uh, which move-by-move -move type book to buy. But uh, um, I think uh, all of these are good, in, including the Morphe one. Yeah, definitely. And I actually, uh, I got to admit, I had to actually um, abandon Nunn's book at some point. I, I felt that it was too advanced for me. Um, and of course, you can still learn something from it. But if you don't, especially the move by move format, if you don't follow all the way, you you kind of get in trouble and, and you your, your learning kind of uh, stops a little bit. Uh, yeah. And at the same... Uh, in, in the same genre, a little bit, Zanon Franco wrote a book called uh, Morphe Move by Move, that Every Man um, Move by Move series, uh, where he doesn't comment on every single move. Uh, I mean, obviously, many of the games are the same because Morphe only played so many games. Um, and, and certainly the competitive games, he only played about, uh, I don't know, 50 or 60. Um, but that is significantly more advanced. And, and and sometimes Franco asks you for the right move to to uh, pick out the right move in a in a certain position, and he has the bad habit of writing this is an easy exercise, which if you can't find the move, it certainly isn't. So uh, I mean that, that's actually that's an extra point for a first book of Morphe that it doesn't 
assume that you know something that you actually don't. So, so there's no doubt that Zanon Franco's Morphe Move by Move book is for more advanced players than a first book of Morphe. It's still yeah. very good, though. And the, the, the same um, big pro goes for, for that book, namely the games of Paul Morphe. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not familiar with that specific book, but I am familiar with the books of Zanon Franco and the Move by Move series uh, from Everyman, as you mentioned, which it is an important caveat that they're not actually Move by Move. Like they're not every single move explained, no, but they're, no, due, they're not. There do tend to be plenty of annotations. Um, so while we have you, Moss, um, I know you're very well read in sort of the the literature geared towards your level. So do you have any other um, uh, other recommendations for for listeners? Uh, yeah, uh, th there's actually uh, there there's this other classic uh, written by uh, Max Oeber, the former world champion, along with his associate Walter Maiden called chess master versus chess amateur and and that has the advantage of also it's it's um, anonymized games so you don't have the same uh, sense of history even though you're reading a book written by a world champion um but that starts out with beatdowns like mm -hmm. uh, games where there's a significant strength difference between uh the master and the amateur And then it slowly progresses to where the amateur gets stronger and stronger. Uh, and he does explain every single move. Uh, it's in descriptive notation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, so that's a really good book to pick up as well and to get a lot out of. Um, there was also... Um, uh, I got to look the names up again, but a, a, a couple of German guys tried to, di to do a, a similar monography about Bobby Fischer's games and kind of distill those into, uh, into chess lessons. Uh, but to my knowledge it's only exists in German. So, so okay. I, I'm not sure if, uh, if it's been translated yet. Yeah. As a linguist, you have the advantage of being able to read all these Fischer's books in, uh... in German, Fischer's <laughs> heritage or Fischer's legacy. Um, so, so what languages do you speak, Moss? Well, Danish is my native language, English, French, German, uh, Italian, Spanish, a little Amazing. bit of Dutch, but, but not that much. And of course, I have to ask you the trite question of uh, similarities or differences between studying, trying to learn chess and learning languages. Um, well, I started with languages when I was a lot younger, so I think that was a big uh, advantage. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's the, the similarity, of course, that whatever you do, whatever you want to learn, start as young as you possibly can. And um, I, I started learning foreign languages um, when I was very young because I'm Danish and we have to. Um, it's a small country as a, a comedian from a Danish comedian called Victor Borge once said, it's such a small country that when you step out your door, you're already in Sweden. Huh. Uh, so foreign languages is kind of part of our DNA here. Um, if I had started out with chess at the same age, I'd probably be a lot better. As yeah. A player. I, I, I venture to say, so I do think there's some correlation between facility with languages and facility with chess, but yeah, as that's you what say, they say. Yeah. Yeah, but when you start when you start as an adult, there's, it's just uh, so so challenging for for both, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, a couple housekeeping notes. Um, an, enough people bugged me that I will be recording some blindfold puzzles when we're done. Um, and our next book recap actually will be with another Danish dad. Uh, shout out to Martin Eustacid of the Say Chess Publishing Empire. Uh, right. Regular listeners know him well. Um, yeah. We'll be we'll be discussing questions of modern chess theory by Isaac Lipnitsky, which is more of an intermediate book um, because we because of your sickness, I'm already halfway through it, so I can I can tease now that I'm enjoying it. Um, but did you know Martin personally? I feel like as you were just saying, uh, everyone in in uh, Denmark <laughs> must be uh, two degrees of separation of. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We grew up together. No, no, we didn't. <laughs> I, I know him through your podcast. That's uh, okay. That, that's how I know him. That's funny, yeah. And I, of course, can see Moss on screen, so I'm looking at him, trying to tell if he's uh, pulling my chain or not. And yeah, I have the microphone in front of my face, so, <laughs> so you can't really see it. But no, 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 I'm kidding. We don't know each other personally. Okay. And uh, and Moss, I'd be happy to make a donation if you have any sort of famous, uh, favorite, rather, chess cause. Do you have any that I could uh, donate to in lieu of uh, paying you for all of your efforts? Well, I... Uh... 
I, I kind of found some inspiration in some of the other book recaps that I've heard. So uh, I would probably go with Chess and Slums. All right. Shout, yeah, shout out to Tunde. I'm always happy to 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 uh, to support he and his team and Aaron and everyone else working on them. So much appreciated. Um, so listeners, if you're interested in the blindfold puzzles, stick around. Uh, Martin and I are hoping to be back in December. I think we'll be done the book. The main constraint will be sort of the holiday season as both of us uh, may be traveling. So if we don't get it out in December, we'll get it out in early January. But Moss, this has been great. I'm glad to see that your health is on the mend. Do you have anything to add before we uh, say goodbye? Only that it's been a real honor to to uh, be a contributor here on, on the podcast. And it's been a lot of fun to go through uh, first book of Morphe again. Okay. And if anyone wants to uh, like uh, check in with you, maybe brainstorm potential books or anything, is there a way they could reach you? Yeah, I actually have a very chess themed Twitter account now at 38 squares. Okay. Um, where I think pretty close to a hundred percent of the people I follow are chess related. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, that that's, that's where, that's where you can I- reach me. Excellent. I will link to that um, and make sure I'm following you as well, Moss. Um, I'm following you. Okay. Well, yeah, so I'll find you easy enough. So thanks again, Moss, and uh, thanks for listening. And uh, listeners, if you're interested in the blindfold puzzle, stick around. Otherwise, we will catch you next time. Hello there, listeners. I am back for the increasingly rare feature of some blindfold puzzles to close out your monthly book recap. So this month we're going with Paul Morphy themed puzzles, and we're going to read you moves from the start of the game and see if you guys can solve them. As always, I will put the moves without spoilers in the show description. So if you want to read the moves and try to picture them yourselves, you can. And then there'll be a link where you link, excuse me, where you can click through to find out the answer um, on a web page. Or if you play the moves on a board, I think you would find it as well. So here comes puzzle number one. Uh, Morphe is actually the victim on this one, although it's just a small tactic. So Morphe is black. Uh, Meek is white, Alexander Meek. Um, the game goes e4, e5, so double king pawn, knight f3, knight c6, pawn to d4, pawn takes pawn, so then instead of knight takes pawn in the scotch, it goes bishop to c4, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, Pawn takes d4, bishop c4. Then black plays bishop c5. White plays knight to g5. Attacking f7. Black plays knight to h6, guarding f7. White takes it anyway. Knight takes f7. Black plays knight takes f7. White now plays bishop takes f7, check. Black plays king takes f7. And what did white set up by giving up the piece on f7? It is white to move. Find the best move. I'll reread the first seven moves without commentary. e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, e takes d4, bishop c4, bishop c5, Knight g5, knight h6, knight takes f7, knight takes f7, bishop takes f7, check, king takes f7, and now it is white to move, and where should they go? That's puzzle number one, slightly easier than the second one, um, but they're around the same level. Um, Honestly, uh It's hard to say how hard. I think if you stick with it, you can probably get it. Um, This one, Morphe is white against Henry Seymour Conway. And the game goes E4, E5, F4, E takes F4, Knight F3, G5, Bishop C4, G4, D4, G takes F3. Queen takes f3, 
Bishop h6. Castles. Knight e7. Bishop takes f4. Bishop takes f4. Bishop takes f7 check. King takes f7. Queen takes f4 check. King g7. And now it is white to move and checkmate in two moves. So I'll read that one more time. Uh, move one, e4, e5. Move two, f4, e takes f4. Move three, knight f3, g5. Move four, bishop c4, g4. Move five, d4, g takes f3. Move six, queen takes f3, bishop h6. Move seven, castles, knight e7. Move eight, bishop takes f4, bishop takes f4. Move nine, bishop takes f7, check. King takes f7. Move 10, queen takes f4, check. King g7. And now it is Morphe to move and checkmate in two moves. So again, you can find the answers in the show notes. Thanks for listening if you made it this far. And we will catch you all soon. Perpetual Chess is proud to be a member of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Be sure to check out their sports and pop culture related podcasts as well. I also, as always, would like to thank Matthew Passy for producing the show. Without Matthew, Perpetual Chess would not exist. And I want to thank everyone who listens to the show, whether it be on your own without telling anyone about it, keeping it secret, or if you're helping to spread the word, all the better, whether it be telling a friend about a particularly impactful interview or whether it be writing a positive review online, all of that stuff helps get the word out and helps Perpetual Chess continue to grow. But most of all, of course, I want to thank those that provide financial support to Perpetual Chess. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would not be possible in its current form. And I would like to give uh, special thanks to the following people and entities. Here comes the list. Uh, Chessable.com, David Lazarus of Lasman Chess, coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, Quality Chess Books, The Capital City Chess Club, The Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adaptive Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, I am Dimitri Schneider, Douglas Wilson, I am Eric Rosen, Farhan Tharwar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Golick, Hampus Axelson, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsyth, Kevin Gilmore, Kevin O'Callaghan, Kevin Pryor, King Cell, the King's Crusher YouTube channel, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oplin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Michael Sullivan, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nace Twitch channel, Perry McManus, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodi, Philip Flemons, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Ray Lillywhite, Reuven Fisher, Rick Rivas, Robert Hansen, Ross Crossland, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gearson, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, and I also would like to thank the following, Hashtag Chess Punks, who are the adult improvers on Chess Twitter, Ace Vallega, Adam Fowler, Adam Johansson, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio Leonfort, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Gruber, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brandon Halseed, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Bruno Johnson, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Ken Kabadi, Chad Hilton, Chad Likens, 
of Rose City Chess in Portland, the Chess Dojo, Chess for Charity, Jacksonville, Chess Patzer, Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Chabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Best, Dave Saylor, David Blaskotchek, David Brown, David Gores, David Hamblin, David Cramley, David Peterson, Dennis Parrish, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Eric Baldwin, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Mayo Perea, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letard Lavoie, Frank Tortoris, MD, Frank Zananes, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Gene Stewart, George Foote, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Gregory Higgins, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovach, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Banastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, Jay Tuttle, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeff Davis, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Horland, Jerry Wells, Jesse DeCumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Jones, Jim Ratliff, Jim Sadler, Joe DeSano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tully, Juan Almagua, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Bannister, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Justin Goodfellow, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Fridell, I am Kari Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Reiferth, Lars Wiesen, Macaulay Peterson, Maria Emelianova, aka Photo Chess, Mark Chaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Butolovich, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matt Ferrari, Matthew Coughlin, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Goble, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Nigma Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, Pablo Davila, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Eckert, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited in Switzerland, um, Randall Montgomery, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbach, Richard McCormick, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Turner, Robert Wall, Robert Wilson, Rory Coleman, Ryan Berg, Samson Teaches Chess, Satyajit Malagu, the Say Chess YouTube channel and publishing empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krauss, Sebastian Finsterwater, Sergey Makagon, Seth Ruzica, Seth Will, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Simon Schmidt, Stefan Roller, Stephen Miller and Tom George, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Terry King, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edsel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Beauchamp, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, Zachary Hoskin, and Zhivkor Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone.